The island of Ireland is home to about 7.2 million people, spread across the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. But despite this political separation, both countries exhibit the same population trend. Every major population center hugs the East Coast, leaving the central region and west coast of the island feeling pretty empty. So why don't more Irish live in the western parts of the island? Welcome to Geography by Jeff. Today we're off to explore the island of Ireland and why it developed in the unique way that it did. And what we're going to find is a unique confluence of historic decisions and, of course, geographic reasons for this. But first, today's podcast episode is a bit different. Given that she has a brand new album coming out, Hunter and I decided to track Taylor Swift around the world to see what her geographic imprint looks like. You can catch that episode right now on YouTube or on whatever app you use to listen to podcasts. All links are in the description below. People have been living on the island of Ireland for a long time. While recent evidence suggests human activity on the island dates back to around 33,000 years ago, it's theorized that the first sustained settlements on the island existed closer to 9,000 years ago, likely arriving through a land bridge from Scotland or by sea. These early settlers were Mesolithic hunter-gatherers, and with the advent of the Neolithic period, Ireland saw the arrival of agriculture, the construction of large stone monuments such as New Grange, and the beginnings of a structured society. The Bronze and Iron Ages heralded further developments, with the arrival of Celtic culture around 600 BCE, introducing a new language and a sophisticated social system. The Celts, more locally known as Gaels, arrived from Galicia in modern-day Spain and organized into various tribes and kingdoms. These early civilizations left a lasting impact on Ireland's linguistic, cultural, and even political landscape. The first significant external influence came with the arrival of Christianity around the 4th century, brought by missionaries like St. Patrick. This transformed Irish society, leading to the foundation of monasteries that became centers of learning and culture not only in Ireland, but across Europe, during what was then known as the Dark Ages. The Viking raids of the 8th century introduced new dynamics, leading to the establishment of coastal towns like Dublin, Waterford, and Limerick. Though initially plunderers, the Vikings eventually settled, trading and intermarrying with the Gaels. But it would be the Norman invasion of Ireland in 1169 that marked the beginning of over 800 years of English influence and eventual rule. Initially invited to assist in a local conflict, the Normans soon established their own territories, building castles and fortifying towns. Despite their influence, the Normans eventually became more Irish than the Irish themselves in some respects, adopting local customs and intermarrying. However, the Tudor conquest of Ireland in the late 1500s, followed by the plantation policies of the 1600s, where English and Scottish settlers were given lands confiscated from Irish chieftains, sowed the seeds for long-term conflict. The penal laws, aimed at diminishing the power of the Catholic majority, further entrenched divisions. All of this built up to the Great Famine in Ireland between 1845 and 1849, a disastrous event caused initially by a bad potato blight, but would primarily be due to intentional inaction by England. This event led to the death of approximately 1 million Irish and the immigration of a million more. The famine profoundly affected Irish society and is a key factor in the population decline that continued for decades. It also intensified calls for land reform and increased nationalist sentiment, leading to a series of movements aiming for independence from Britain. The early 1900s was a tumultuous period for Ireland, culminating in the Easter Rising of 1916, the War for Independence, and the subsequent Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1921. This treaty established the Irish Free State as a dominion within the British Empire, but also partitioned the island, creating Northern Ireland, which remained part of the United Kingdom. This division sparked the Irish Civil War and sowed the seeds for future conflicts, particularly in Northern Ireland, where decades of sectarian violence known as the Troubles would begin in the late 1960s up to the late 1990s. Today, Ireland is split between the Republic of Ireland, an independent country since 1949, and Northern Ireland, which continues to be part of the United Kingdom, both united by a single physical geography that will forever bind them together. But before we get to the geography of Ireland, if you're enjoying this video, hit that subscribe button. More fun geography videos are just a single click away. The island of Ireland, nestled in the North Atlantic Ocean, is well known for its greenery. So much so, in fact, that the entire island has been given the nickname of the Emerald Isle. 
and this is largely due to the unique geographic position Ireland has found itself in. Located between the 51 and 55 degrees northern latitudes, Ireland is basically the first place in Europe to be hit by weather and winds that are carried by the jet stream and pick up speed over the Atlantic Ocean. This means that Ireland's climate is classified as oceanic, marked by mild temperatures, consistent rainfall, and generally the absence of extreme temperatures. This climate is heavily influenced by the North Atlantic Drift, a continuation of the Gulf Stream, which brings warm waters to Ireland's shores, moderating the temperature. And of course, rainfall is a defining feature of the Irish climate. While the West Coast receives the most rain, thanks to the prevailing westerly winds, the East Coast, sheltered by the central mountains, tends to be drier and slightly warmer. Speaking of mountains, Ireland is not flat. While it doesn't have high peaks, its topography is characterized by a series of low-lying mountains that encircle a central plain, creating a bowl-like formation. The highest peaks are found in the southwest, with Carantuil in County Kerry reaching 1,038 meters above sea level, part of the McGillicuddy's Freaks Range. These mountains are not only significant for their height, but also for their geologic composition, with ancient sandstone and quartzite telling stories of Ireland's ancient past. The central plains of Ireland, in contrast, are a mix of peat bogs, lakes, and fertile agricultural lands. This area is the heartland of Ireland's agricultural prowess, thanks to its rich, loamy soils. The bogs, such as the Bog of Allen, are significant carbon sinks and hold records of Ireland's environmental history, preserved in layers of peat. Ireland's rivers also play a crucial role in its geography, with the River Shannon standing out as the longest river between both Ireland and Britain. Stretching over 360 kilometers, it drains the central plains, meandering through several lakes, including Loch Derg and Loch Ree, before reaching the Atlantic Ocean at Limerick. The Shannon, along with rivers like the Boyne, the Blackwater, and the Barrow, has been vital for inland navigation, trade, and settlement patterns throughout Ireland's history. Finally, because it's an island, Ireland has an extensive and rugged coastline. With a length of about 7,500 kilometers, it is renowned for its dramatic cliffs, such as the Cliffs of Moher, which rise over 120 meters above the Atlantic Ocean. The coastline is indented with numerous bays, inlets, and peninsulas, such as the Iverag Peninsula, home to the Ring of Kerry and Dingle Peninsula. These features are the result of glacial activity during the last ice age, which sculpted Ireland's landscape, leaving behind fjords, such as Calary Harbor and the drumlins that pepper the northern landscape. Ireland's geography paints a pretty dramatic picture, and if you've been keeping up, you can start to understand why so many Irish live on the East Coast and not the West. Ireland's population is not divided equally, and despite existing across two separate countries, a noticeable pattern has emerged across the entire island. Most major population centers are located on the East Coast, leaving the Central Region and West Coast feeling pretty empty, and the reasons for this are as much geographic as they are historic. The historic aspect of English colonization plays a pivotal role in understanding this demographic pattern. The colonization of Ireland by England began in the 11th century and intensified under the Tudor monarchs. The eastern part of Ireland, being physically closest to England, was the first to be colonized and the most heavily influenced by English settlement policies, particularly during the plantation periods of the 16th and 17th centuries. Dublin, situated on the East Coast, emerged as the epicenter of English administration and military power in Ireland. It was the seat of English administration, around which economic activities flourished, attracting settlers, merchants, and subsequently a larger population, both from within Ireland and from external immigration. The desire for proximity to England further cemented the East's prominence. Being closer to England meant easier access to the administrative and economic heart of the British Empire, facilitating trade, communication, and military reinforcement. Ports on the eastern coast, such as Dublin, Cork, and Belfast, became bustling hubs of trade and commerce, not just with England, but also with the rest of the world. This economic advantage spurred urban development and population growth in these areas, in contrast to the West, which remained more isolated from direct English influence in major global trade routes. The physical geography of Ireland also contributed to the population disparity between the East and the West. The Western part of Ireland is characterized by a more rugged terrain, with numerous mountain ranges, rocky landscapes, and a deeply indented coastline. These features, while stunningly beautiful, posed challenges for agriculture, transportation, and urban development. The Western regions receive higher rainfall, 
and are more exposed to the Atlantic winds, making the climate harsher compared to the more sheltered and fertile east. In contrast, the eastern part of Ireland boasts relatively flatter lands, especially in the central plains, which extend into the east. These areas have more fertile soils and were more suitable for agriculture and settlement. Meanwhile, the general topography of the east facilitated the development of roads and later railways, further enhancing its attractiveness for settlement and urban development. Over centuries of development, these factors combined to create a self-reinforcing cycle. Economic opportunities and administrative importance attracted more people to the east, which led to further development of infrastructure and services, which in turn attracted even more settlers. Meanwhile, the west remained more rural with smaller towns and less industrial development. This trend is seen across both the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, showcasing the two countries' similarities in development and population, which begs the question, if these two are so similar, could they ever reunite into a single, unified Irish country? The potential for a united Ireland, merging the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland into a single country, has long been the subject of political, social, and cultural discourse. And this idea has gained renewed momentum in the wake of the United Kingdom's exit from the European Union, a seismic event that has shifted national priorities within Northern Ireland and altered the dynamics of Irish-British relations. And at the heart of all of this is the Good Friday Agreement, a cornerstone of peace and the framework within which a united Ireland might be pursued. The Good Friday Agreement, signed in 1998, was a monumental achievement in the peace process, ending decades of conflict known as the Troubles and laying the groundwork for power sharing in Northern Ireland. One of its key provisions allows for a referendum on Irish unification if it appears likely that a majority of Northern Ireland would support it. For years, the prospect of such a referendum remained a distant possibility. But Brexit has raised the issue once again. You see, Northern Ireland, which voted to remain in the EU, has found itself at the center of complex negotiations and arrangements to maintain an open border with the Republic of Ireland a European Union member. This open border is crucial, not just for economic reasons, but also for the social and political fabric that has been carefully maintained since the Good Friday Agreement. The prospect of any hardening of the border raises concerns about the return to a less peaceful era, undermining the spirit of cooperation that has prevailed between the two countries. The path to a united Ireland, however, is still fraught with complexities. It requires not just a majority in favor in Northern Ireland, but also a consideration of the Republic of Ireland's readiness to integrate an additional population into its own systems. There are significant questions about the economic viability, the social integration of communities with deep cultural divides, and the political adjustments required to accommodate the Unionist identity within a united Ireland. For its part, the European Union's stance on a potential united Ireland has been noteworthy. The EU has indicated that, much like the case of East and West Germany, Northern Ireland would automatically be part of the EU if it were to unify with the Republic of Ireland. This stance adds an additional layer to the calculus of unification, offering a potential pathway back into the EU for Northern Irish residents. Will that ever actually happen though? Only the Northern Irish can say for certain. Ireland is a beautiful island, but a unique confluence of historic and geographic reasons keep most Irish hugging the East Coast. And due to the closeness the two countries continue to have with the United Kingdom and European Union, that's not likely to change anytime soon. Hey, today's episode was all about Ireland, and you can join me there in person later this year. Early bird tickets are going fast, so be sure to sign up as soon as possible. Hotels, meals, guides, and transportation around Ireland are all included. Plus, I'll be there with you the entire time. So sign up today. All links are in the description below. I hope you enjoyed learning all about Ireland. If you did, please subscribe to my channel. If you want to watch more videos, click here. Thanks for watching. See you next time.